Sunday morning, and I just love to see all the new faces and how the church is healthy and growing, and Pastor Stephen and Jaylen are doing an amazing job as campus pastors here. Would you give it up for him and them this morning? They just had another new grandbaby recently, and so their uh, children, some of them live in Oklahoma, so uh, Miss Jaylen is in Oklahoma with the grandbaby this morning. So somebody needs to buy Pastor Stephen's lunch today. He's all... <laughs> But I don't blame them. I have a few grandchildren of my own, and you'll drive to the other end of the world to be with grandchildren, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't have grandchildren yet, the best is yet to come. Uh, they're greater than children. I don't know how that is, but they are. I love my children, but I really love my grandchildren, so uh, it's a blessing. I love what God is doing in this place. There's just such a healthy uh, atmosphere and environment here for the presence of God. Worship was wonderful. You guys are doing an amazing job as a worship team, and Thank you for all uh, you do. And then as we gathered early, our teams gather long before everyone else gathers at church and, and pray together and just uh, see what God is doing. And it was good this morning. We highlighted all of our different ministry leaders uh, in this place and to see the whole front of the church full of people that are serving in roles here at the church from children to nursery to youth to young adults to worship and parking and the list goes on and on and on thank every one of you and i just want to encourage you i think it was said earlier there is a place for every single one of you here we believe that as a church we're one body made up of many members and every member has a function there's not one person one part of the body that's not important there may be some that are a little more out front than others but listen, there's nothing inside of me that I want to do without. I don't want you to cut me open and take anything out. I feel like God made everything inside of me for a purpose, and I'm glad it's there. Whether you see it or not, my heart is beating this morning. Um, hopefully every, all my organs are working properly this morning. Uh, and so you can't see all those things, but you're glad they're there. And not every part of the church body is out front and is seen, but it's all valuable. In fact, the Lord says that those that are seen less may have greater value than those that are seen more. And so thank you for being here. I know many of you are here for the first time or it's just been recently. And I'm grateful to God that he's sending people uh, to the Heights Church. There's so many things happening here and so many things to come. We're just getting started. And I don't have time to go into the story, but it's a beautiful story of what God's done even in the last year uh, between bringing a couple of churches together in this region to really, I believe, take a city, to, to share the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ with every person in this region. And what I'm finding is it's not just in Hillsboro, but this region uh, throughout this area. And so God has allowed us to be a part of that. In just the last few years, we've multiplied uh, over and over and now have campuses, one in Hillsboro, Burleson, Cleburne, Granbury, and are believing God for one a little farther towards the east. So be praying with us. Uh, we don't know exactly where that'll be, but from, from Central, our Central Campus in Cleburne, we believe that could be in the uh, Middle Othian or Mansfield area. I uh, met a family this morning, been going to Waxahachie. Uh, I just believe God wants us to be a part of that harvest that's all in this region. And if you've been in Texas very long and have been in this area very long, there's more houses going in right now than I've ever seen in my life. One day those houses will have families in them, and those families need Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So let me get into that this morning as a part of what I'm talking about today. 1 Kings chapter 21. So turn there with me. 1 Kings 21 and verse 1. They'll have it on the screen as well. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. So ah Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near and it seems good to you uh, and is near next to my house and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it or if it seems good to you I will give you its worth in money but Naboth said to Ahab the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you there was a man Naboth who had this this vineyard right next to the palace and evidently it was his inheritance that had been passed down from generations and there was an obvious and evident blessing upon this property because the King Ahab had access to all the land around uh, everywhere, uh, all around the palace. He owned it all and had the ability to buy just about anything he wanted. But the, what he wanted more than anything was this man's vineyard that was next to him because of the blessing that was on it. 
It was like he walked out to the edge of the palace every day and said, man, that's the piece of property I want. I can have anything I want as a king, but that one right there, that's the one I want. It has such a great blessing on it. And so he would probably go and just like, man, one day I'm going to own that. And I would imagine knock the door of, of Naboth often and say, hey, you want to sell your land? <laughs> Some of you know what that's like. Some of you have been on a piece of property where people are knocking your door all the time saying, do you want to sell? Like, no, I don't want to sell. I like my property. Others of you looking for property are knocking someone else's door saying, would you like to sell? I mean, that's the kind of market we're in right now. But Naboth understood what he had and how valuable it was. And it wasn't just a piece of property to him. It was his spiritual inheritance, his godly inheritance that had been passed down for generations. And it wasn't just that he was a better uh, steward of the property than others. Our, our king would have said, uh, Naboth, won't you come work for me? That wasn't it. There was something about the blessing that was upon the land. And Naboth knew it, and he says rightfully, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. The title of my message this morning is, Hang on to your godly inheritance. Hang on to your godly inheritance. Naboth was determined it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much land you're willing to trade me. I will not give up the land that was given to me by my fathers. He said, there's not enough money to buy it. You know, you know what it made King Ahab do? King Ahab went home to his wife and just pouted like a baby. The king uh, uh, came and said, that's the only thing I want. I, I want it bad. He's throwing a fit because he can't have that piece of land. But, a, uh, but Naboth was determined, nobody's going to take this land from me. That's how valuable it is. And there ought to be something on the inside of us that rises up, realizing that we have, many of us, a godly inheritance that we're not willing to sell out for. If we look at the condition of our nation today, part of the reason we are where we are is because people didn't understand the value or the importance of their godly heritage or inheritance, and they sold it out for other things. They traded it for other things much less valuable. They got caught up in the moment. Reminds me of the prodigal son that didn't understand the value of what he had at home. He's in the father's house with all the blessings and all the access to anything that he wants. And yet he decides, I want to go have what I can have. I want to go find out what's in the world. I want to go figure it out for myself. Give me my inheritance now. And he sells out in his inheritance to go discover what he's missing out on only to find out everything he actually needed and wanted was right there in the family's inheritance it's kind of like jacob and esau when esau says man he's he's out hunting for something he's out hunting for food when there was food in the house you got to be careful when you're looking for something that you already actually have and probably have better than what you're looking for but the enemy will come and try to cause you to, hey, let's go out here and let's, let's look over the fence and let's look, go look at what you don't have when the greatest things that you have are right here in the inheritance or the legacy you already do have. Amen. Esau traded his inheritance for a bowl of beans because he was looking for food in all the wrong places when he had food right at home and he and ends up selling out to his brother what, was, uh, what belonged to him because he didn't understand the value of the inheritance didn't understand the value of the blessing and here ahab is a man that says uh, i mean uh, 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 not ahab ahab's the king but naboth is a man that says you're not getting my land you're not getting my inheritance you're not getting my blessing i wonder how many people out there today don't understand the value of a spiritual blessing through inheritance you know naboth says this was given to me by my fathers who were his fathers who, who, who were his fathers that understood the blessing of passing on an inheritance? Not just a piece of land, but I'm talking about a godly inheritance, the godly blessing that came with it. If you track his genealogy back, you find that Naboth is connected all the way back to Abraham. So the blessing that was pronounced by Abraham to his children, to Isaac, then to Jacob and Esau, and then eventually through Jacob to Joseph, this blessing that was passed down has been passed down for generations. Now Naboth is just one of many that are living the beauty of the inherited blessing. That's how valuable, this is generational and he's hanging on to it for generations and the blessing is still attached to it. Some thousand years later, Naboth is still living and enjoying the blessing that was passed down all the way back to Abraham. See, there are a few people that understand the worth of the inheritance. When we talk about Joseph, many of you know the story of Joseph. 
Joseph was born, and he was born uh, with the blessing. His, his father, Jacob, said, this is the son I've always wanted, the son to my most favorite wife. And so when she's barren for a long time, finally has a child, he's so excited. He puts a coat of many colors upon this child and says, man, what a blessing. I'm extending my blessing to Joseph. And then Joseph was despised and rejected for the blessing. But no matter what came against him, he wasn't willing to sacrifice uh, hanging on to that righteous standard because he knew it was attached to the blessing. And so even though his brothers tried to kill him and they did sell him as a slave and he ended up in Potiphar's house, he, he would not defame or defile himself because he was hanging on to an inheritance or a blessing that he was not willing to let go of. Even in the bottom of the pit in prison, again, still standing strong for his Christian values and beliefs in God in the sense that I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up my inheritance. No matter where I land, I'm going to hang on to who I am. And you can take my coat off of me on the outside, but you can never take it from me on the inside. I find it interesting, twice his coat was ripped off of him because they were trying to get the blessing. See, when you've got the blessing of God, everybody else sees it sometimes more than you do. And, and we can be murmuring and complaining and, and whining in our present situation when everyone else around you is looking at you going, I just wish I had a portion of what you had. And, I mean, you're, you're complaining about the little things, but when we see you from, from the outside, you are so blessed. You have something that the world longs for. You have eternity. You have life. You have the Spirit of God on the inside of you that's more valuable than any amount of money more desirable than any nice home or fancy car or, or the great job when you have the presence of God living on the inside of you it's priceless and it's worth hanging on to it's worth living for and it's worth dying for and here we see that that this gentleman who had the the vineyard says Naboth says I'm not giving up my inheritance to no one not even to the king let me give you some points this morning the enemy wants your godly inheritance now, Naboth was the king, but in this case, he was not living righteously at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was after that vineyard for himself. And so he was willing to do whatever it took to get this vineyard. And I'm telling you, the enemy will try to do whatever he can do to take that inheritance. Why? Because many, many, many years ago, before you and I were ever created, Satan himself was in the presence of God as one of the worship leaders in heaven. And he, he was enjoying the beauty of this blessing of heaven, the blessing of the presence of God and, and all of these things that he was enjoying. And yet he rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven. So he lost his inheritance. He traded his inheritance for a little pride and a little fame, a little self-recognition and so now his thought is, well, I'll just take what's yours if I can't have what was mine. I'll just take yours from you. He can't have it. Even if he were to take it from you, it's going to do him no good. But maybe something about him says, if I can't have it, you can't have it either. And so Naboth here is operating out of an unhealthy, evil spirit to take not just a piece of property. He could have any piece of property. I believe he's trying to regain or take back the blessing that was on him. And, and this is what you see in the life of Joseph as you see Joseph's story. And it's a long story. I don't have time to get into all of it. But in Joseph's story, thank you. In Joseph's story, you see how that his brothers ripped the coat off of him early on. Now, we just think they're just being mean to him and they just want his father to think he's dead. I think there's more to it than that. This coat represents the blessing. That's, that's, that's what says the blessing. So let's take the blessing from Joseph because we want the blessing. We don't want him to have the blessing. That was what the whole, who do you think you are, the younger brother that's getting our inheritance? Wait a minute. This is not how this is worked. The oldest is supposed to get the inheritance, and, and we all get a, but it seems like the bulk of this inheritance, for some reason, is going to this young favorite son, and the coat is proof that, that the earmark of the tag that says, I get the greatest blessing. And so by ripping his coat off of him, what are they trying to do? They're trying to take back what they feel like should be theirs. Listen, the blessing has to be passed on by being given by the Father to the Son. You can't just demand. You can't just take it. It has to be given. Joseph didn't ask for the blessing. Joseph just received the blessing, yet they tried to tear his coat off to get it. The enemy was after that blessing. You go a little farther when he's in Potiphar's house. 
And you see that he's framed, set up by Potiphar's wife who wants to be with him, wants, wants to be after him. I find it interesting that when there at the end, when she tries to have him come into her inner chambers and, and be intimate with her, and he wasn't having it, he flees for his life. But what does she do? She reaches out and grabs his cloak and she rips his coat off. If I can't have you, just let me have the blessing. Well, she didn't get the blessing, but I believe that it was obvious. The Bible says clearly, that this is what it says. It says, so it was from the time they had made, uh, the time Potiphar had made Joseph overseer of his house, that all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. This man who owned it all put everything in the responsibility of Joseph's hand, and the Bible said everything that Joseph touched was blessed. In the house and in the field. In other words, I don't know what it is about this young man, but everywhere he goes and whatever he touches has this tremendous blessing upon it. So I'm going to make him ruler over everything because I want everything blessed. That was that inherited blessing that was passed on from Abraham all the way to him. And now everyone sees it. At least Potiphar was wise enough to say, if I can't have it, I'll at least use it for my own gain. Uh, that's why some of you get promoted when others don't because wise people say I don't know what it is about that person but they have the blessing put them at the top because wherever they go we're blessed and and that's just wisdom right you want to you want to surround yourself with people that have the blessing so this is what Potiphar does and this is what happens in Joseph but she tries to grab that coat she's trying to take that blessing and the enemy will spend a lifetime trying to grab your blessing trying to cause you to stumble and fall. He, he, will, he will wait for that right moment, that right opportunity to take it because he's not after you. You're nothing to him. He's after that inheritance that he lost that you possess. And whether you realize it or not, the richness, the fact that you're in church this morning, I pray being born again, having Jesus Christ in your life, the Spirit of God in your life, the, 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 the reason he's bringing me something to hold my water. I can put it here, but We'll put it there. Um, the reason this blessing exists is because it's been passed down. And, and I pray that no matter how you got here, some of you got here because you had a praying grandma or a great grandma or distant family members, whether you realize it or not, they prayed you into the kingdom and you're a part of that inheritance and that legacy. Some of you may not have had that opportunity, at least not that you know of, but you find yourself here and that inheritance starts with you to be passed down to your family, but it's worth guarding because the enemy is after and would love to try to take what belongs to you. This blessing so strong that, as I said, it's been passed down from a thousand years. The blessing that was spoken from Abraham to Jacob says, I'm going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a company of peoples. I will give you this land to your offspring and after you for the perpetual holding. And we see a man named Naboth who is enjoying the benefit of the inherited blessing even a thousand years down the way, down the way, down the road. That's the power of this inherited blessing. My second point is this, don't give up your godly inheritance. Fight for it and hang on to it. Don't give up to anybody your godly inheritance because the enemy can't take it unless you give it to him. You need to know that. The, the, the enemy cannot take your salvation. The enemy cannot take your spiritual blessing or inheritance. He has no right to take it from you unless you voluntarily give it to him. So you're not just going to be asleep one night. He's going to just sneak in your house and take your inheritance. He can't do it. God will not allow it. The only way it's given up is if you decide to give it up. Now be careful that he not walk you down a path where one day you're willing to trade it like Esau was. But he can't just come and take it from you. So how do we give it up? If, if giving it up is even a possibility, let me give you a couple things that I believe are important. you got to be careful not to leave the father's house. Because when you walk away from the father's house, you risk giving up your inheritance. If you remember the prodigal, he had the inheritance and they were already enjoying it while he was in the father's house. And he says, give me what belongs to me. I want my inheritance now. Now if even if he'd have taken his inheritance now, 
but stayed in the father's house, he'd have probably been okay. He, he, could have got, he could have at least seen what I have coming when you die. I have it. It's in my possession. It's right here among all of us, but it's safe in the father's house. But once he takes that inheritance and walks away from the father's house and walks out into the world, he begins losing slowly the inheritance. Not really slowly at all. It begins going quick. I don't know if you've ever known. I've never known anybody personally. Well, I've known one person that hit the lotto for uh, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Can I tell you how fast that couple hundred thousand dollars went? Some of you hear stories about people that get millions. And it does, you think, man, I could live the rest of my life on a few million dollars. Well, evidently not. Not if you get it all at once. Because uh, it, it's actually proven that most people that get a large lump sum in, in a moment end up losing it all in a very short time. Sometimes they're worse off because they got it than they'd ever been if they wouldn't have received it at all. And so this inheritance can go quickly if you step out. There is safety and protection hanging on to your spiritual inheritance by staying in the house of God. Amen. It's key. You can look at, at families all over, that, that families that are in church, that are following after God, that are being fed and growing spiritually, continue to grow that spiritual legacy and that spiritual inheritance. Those that step out, I know people that come in far from God, get in church, they get the blessing, haven't had it in a while. It feels so great. After six months or a year, man, we are doing so amazing. Our marriage is better. Our children are better. Our finances are better. Everything's going right. So I don't really need God anymore because everything's great. And church becomes less of a priority. Being in the house of God, less of a priority. And they begin slipping out only to find themselves six months or a year or two years later as bad or worse off than they were before they came in. I see it over and over and over. These cycles of life. Can I tell you, it's better just to stay in than to go in and out, in and out. Where would you be if the inheritance was growing for you throughout all of this time? That there weren't seasons where you were gone and the seasons of drought and seasons where you, God blessed you big and then you lost it all. And then God blessed you big and then you lost it all. What if you just said, God, I'm just going to stay in your house yes. and I'm going to hang on to the blessing and I'm going to let the blessing grow. Can I tell you, it'll be more than you'll ever be able to enjoy. Physical and unphysical things. I'm telling you, there's a connection between this blessing because Naboth had this vineyard that was producing more than anybody else's vineyard. Joseph, everywhere he went, the fields were producing. Everything was blessed. So people say, well, are you, are you saying that, that, that these physical blessings are, are God's will? I, I, my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the hills as well. And we're not ones that say, I need a lot of money. Because when you got the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, you have need of nothing. But having things is, is nice. Driving a nice car, living in a nice house, or just having things. There's nothing wrong with that. Having things, there's nothing wrong with having things as long as things don't have you. It, everything you have belongs to God and you hold it lightly. So tomorrow he says, hey, I blessed you with that car. Give it away. You know what you say? It was never fully mine. It was the blessing of God. I can release it. We believe that. We've been blessed and we've been a blessing. And we hold our hands lightly saying, God, just use us. If we get to enjoy it for a while, that's great. If you want to pass it through us to someone else, that's great also. So we're letting this blessing multiply on the inside of us, but not just for us. Think of where your children are going to be if they get to be raised in a blessing much greater than you were able to be raised in. Both physically and spiritually, and I believe they're attached. If your children are raised in church, never have to taste the, the wickedness of the world. Grow up in the presence of God, the atmosphere of God's kingdom. Never know what darkness looks like. Never know what drugs and alcohol looks like. Never have been in a party. Can I tell you, I've never been, that I can remember, I've never been in a, in a secular party like what you see on TV in my entire life. The only bars I've ever been into were like Chili's and, and, and Bennigan's or what some of these like restaurants that have a bar. I've never been in a nightclub in my life. Never been out in the dancing scene in my life. Never tried drugs in my life. Tried a little bit of alcohol as a teenager because I had cousins that were wild and crazy like most of you had. And so I drank about a half a beer in my lifetime and it was disgusting. I'm like, I, I don't want no part of that. 
have been closely around it, but never had to be in it and never had to walk through those things. I'm not trying to brag. I'm saying because my family had me in church in the right kind of atmosphere, I was enjoying the blessing or the inheritance, a godly inheritance, so I didn't have to taste those things. My children have never tasted those things. I don't want my grandchildren, my uh, grandkids to ever taste those things. It's a part of this spiritual godly inheritance or legacy that we're leaving for them. So don't let anyone take your blessing. My second point is this. Be careful who you marry or who you attach yourself to. We look at this story of Ahab. Ahab's trying to take what belongs to another man. Listen, God is not into taking what belongs to others. He said, don't don't covet what belongs to your neighbor, right? That's one of the commandments. And so why was he coveting what someone else had? The truth is God wanted him to have it for himself, not to have to covet someone else's. But evidently, he didn't have the blessing that his neighbor had. Why? Well, if you go back through history and, and study out King Ahab's life, he was actually in line for the blessing. He was raised a young Jewish boy, having memorized the, the books of the Bible, the Torah, and, and having been raised in a godly home and had this spiritual legacy or inheritance that was building for him even to be king. It was a God, part of God's plan for that blessing to overtake his life like it had his forefathers' lives, but he made a mistake. He marries a lady named Jezebel. Have anybody ever heard that name before? Jezebel was a, was a high priestess for Baal, for a false god. So she was way up in leadership in worshiping idolatry and false gods. He finds her physically attractive like many times the enemy tries to present themselves very attractive on the outside, but very deadly and unattractive on the inside. Listen, beauty is way deeper than skin deep. And so you have to be careful of who you're attaching yourself. He marries this woman named Jezebel. And everything changes. She's wicked. She's evil. In fact, if you find the story out, when he comes crying home to her saying, all I want is that piece of property, she says, I'll get you that piece of property. And she sets it up to have Naboth killed so that they can take over his property. Pretty evil woman. Because of who he married, he doesn't get to enjoy the blessing or the inheritance that God had for him. You need to be careful. There's a lot of young people in this room this morning. You need to be careful who you allow yourself to become attached to. I tell my children, and they're, and they're grown and only one left to be married. I'm still telling her, listen, you've got to be careful. You can fall in love with a rock. You can fall in love with anything or anyone if you allow yourself to. I'm in love. Listen. Being in love and outside of the will of God are two different things. (laughs) I know people that love their car and love the chicken fried steak. They're going to have it at lunch. They love a lot of things. i got to have it. But is that what God wants for your life? Do you love God more than you love anything else? And is anything you're attaching yourself hindering your relationship with God as a priority? That's the most important thing. And and you can sacrifice your godly inheritance by who you marry. You can also sacrifice your godly inheritance by who you connect yourself to. Bad company corrupts good morals. You begin to become like those you hang around. So I'm going to lead them. Well, there is more of them than there is of you. You need to be careful. Don't go in alone. Even Jesus sent out his disciples in twos. Why? Why? Because I'm over here having a weak moment thinking I'm leaning in and my buddy's like, get out of there. What are you doing? We don't do that stuff. Come over here. God knows you don't need to go out in this world alone. You need to have an accountability partner to say, oh, no, we're not going over there. We're not leaning over there. Let's not do that. And so you risk your spiritual or godly inheritance and legacy when you begin hanging out with the wrong people. You're eagles. You're not turkeys and buzzards. And you've heard the story of the eagle that thought he was a turkey or a buzzard. Listen, you don't belong in those places. You belong soaring high above all the evil and the wickedness of this world by the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of you. But if you hang around with the wrong people long enough, you'll sacrifice what God has for you. And it doesn't just affect you. It affects generations to come. The giants you won't face and kill, your children will face tomorrow. Are you willing to put them in a place where they have to be facing giants their whole life? Or would you say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to face and destroy these giants now so that my children and grandchildren won't have to face them later. 
The third point is this. Bless your family with a godly inheritance. If you have it, and many of you do, what's it take to have a godly inheritance? It takes repentance, coming to the end of myself, saying, God, I don't want to live my way and do things my way. I want, to, I want to submit my life to you. I want to surrender my life to you. I want you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. I want you to be the Lord and the master of my life, and I want you to lead me into the way I should go. I, I'm not in control anymore. I'm a servant of the Most High God. And when we do that, when we believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that he died on a cross, not just for a, a good storyline and for us to talk about for eternity, this man that was crucified. No, I deserve the death penalty for sin, and every one of you deserve the death penalty for sin. The Bible says the, the wages of sin or the cost of sin is death. And there's not one person in the earth that is not sin. Jesus was the only one who has ever been in the face of the earth that has not sinned. And so if we've ever sinned, according to God's law, we deserve death. Now, the only way we could be pardoned is if someone would take the death penalty for me. Larry, you want to take the death penalty for me? I mean, I know we're good friends. I know spiritually you're, like, you're supposed to, and that's the right thing to do. And we would probably say, yeah, buddy, I'd do it for you. But when we get out there and start nailing you to the cross, it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be real tough when we're all watching you take the nails for me as much as you love me. Now, you'd more likely do it for your wife or your children than you would for me. But the reality is his death for me wouldn't work because he has sin too. So who's going to take his death for him? He can't pay the price for my sin because he's, a, he's not, not a sinless sacrifice. He has sin also. So now we're in a problem here because someone needs to pay the price for my sin and no one in here is worthy because we're all sinners. Come on. Only Jesus could be the one, the one who had never sinless sacrifice for any of us or for all of us. And when we realize that what he did on that cross was not just for a few people that day, but for all mankind for eternity, the ultimate sacrifice that I, if I will believe that he died for me to forgive my sins, my sins can be forgiven. Now I have this inheritance. The Bible says we become heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. We become adopted children, part of the family of God. And he says, everything I have is yours. This inheritance is all yours. All of the kingdom of heaven belongs to any and every one of you that are believers that have Jesus Christ living in your heart and you become a son or a daughter of God. We don't even comprehend or understand the inheritance that is set aside for us. Not just when we die, but to be enjoyed and taken advantage of right now. Life instead of death. Freedom instead of bondage. Health instead of sickness. It's all a part of our spiritual godly inheritance that we've been given because of adoption. And we don't even understand the fullness of it or how important it is. That's why too many people give it up because they've never opened up the wheel or the package or, or went into the vault and said, Oh my goodness, there's all kinds of things attached to this inheritance. I don't have to have stress. I don't have to have anxiety. I don't have to have fear. I don't have to worry about my children or my grandchildren because God puts this uh, protect. See, if you don't know what your inheritance is, you can't walk in it and enjoy it and fight for it. You don't even know that's yours to fight for. If, if, if I told you that someone was going to come and, and buy all of this land next to us, it wouldn't bother you at all probably. It's a thousand acres right here on the side of this hill. And someone's going to come and buy it all. You say, oh, we don't want them next to our church. But if I told you, you, you guys don't even know it, but you own that thousand acres. And someone else is fixing to get it from you. And you're not even going to get the money from it because you don't even know you own it. It's a different story. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't know I owned that thousand acres. Now, yeah, you, you owned it and didn't know it. So now it's like, well, you can't just come take it from me. If that's mine, I'm hanging on to it. There's a lot of value out there. I could see a big, beautiful home out there. Oh, it, it comes with a lot of money, and you can build the home on it too? I didn't know that. That's how rich our spiritual and godly inheritance and legacy is. The power to raise the dead is a part of that legacy. Hallelujah. That might not mean a lot to you, but I was at a swimming pool with a, a family friend when we were younger, and his boy drowned in that swimming pool and wrecked our world. Fortunately, 
by the grace of God, someone in that circle understood the power of the Holy Spirit and crying out to God as a part of what belongs to us, the life-giving, life-raising power of God. And we began to pray in the Spirit like we had never prayed before out of desperation, and it had been a while since this young boy had drowned. He, I've never felt death like I felt death that day. And in that prayer circle with him laying on that concrete and us gathered around just crying out to God, he begins to cough up all this water and comes back conscious again and we saw a miracle had someone not realized the strength of the inherited blessing we would have just let that slip away and not fought for it so knowing that you can raise the dead may not be important today but might be important tomorrow Knowing that cancer can't kill you may not be important today, but might be important tomorrow. Because we live in this fallen world we, where we see all of these things. Yet we serve a God that's greater. Now, I can't explain everything, and I can't tell you the reasons why sometimes it happens and sometimes it don't. But what I do know without a shadow of doubt is that all things are possible to them who believe. Nothing is impossible with our God. And I'm not going to let things happen without realizing, wait a minute, that's not, that's not permitted because I'm a part of this inherited blessing. I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And unless he says it's okay, then it's not okay. So unless he says you can have this land, get behind me, Satan, get out of here, you can't have it. And you can't have my wife or my children or my grandchildren. And I pray the blessing, just like it did with Naboth, I pray it passes for a thousand more generations. Long after I'm gone, I'm praying generationally that the families that are produced from my bloodline are godly, rich Christian families walking in the inherited blessing. There's so many stories, and, and I need to close. There's so many stories of the life I'm living, the life we're living I, I'm living as a part of an inherited blessing that, that I haven't earned or deserved, but was just passed down. My father-in-law pastored for 33 years of the church that I'm now pastoring. And his father was a pastor. And they're, they're, they had some 10 or 12 brothers and sisters, and every one of them were in ministry. Missionaries and worship leaders and pastors all over the region and then it's passed on because we got that inheritance passed on to us so that all of, I have four children and three of those are married. So I have seven children and now I have five grandchildren. Every one of those are in ministry. Pastor Ferris's family, my father-in-law who passed here 33 years, how, I don't even know how big the family is. There's, when we get together for Christmas and we do, we could fill up a building this size right here. I mean, I think she says she has 30 something great grandchildren. And my mother-in-law is not that old. So she has all these grandkids, all these, she had four children that all got married. They all had, some had six children, some had two children, but probably averaging four children. And so that's a lot. And then all those grandkids are having a lot of children and that's a lot. And every one of them, 100% of them are in church. And the majority of them are serving in some area of ministry, not just coming to church on Sundays, but have an active role in ministry all the way down to the great grandkids. Now, they're, they're small, but they're coming up. All the grandchildren are, are grown now, and every one of them serving in coffee bars or guest central or on worship teams or in youth ministry or all over the place. People say, well, who's that? Oh, that's my niece. Oh, who's that? That's my nephew. I mean, I, I just forget they're all over the place. That inherited blessing. You want to value the inheritance. The enemy will try to steal it from you. He, he comes in all kinds of ways to try to tell you it's not worth fighting for. That's a lie. It's more precious than silver and gold. Fight for your godly inheritance. Don't give it up for any reason. The only way he can have it is if you give it to him. Determine early on like Naboth did. There's not enough money in this world. There's not enough land to take my inheritance. And then be willing to say, all right, guys, you need to tell your children. If you have children, you need to tell your children, hey, I want you to know there's an, there's an inherited blessing, this spiritual blessing that's yours that belongs to you. And listen, it passes down from generation to generation. If there's things you're lacking, I'm telling you, just begin to believe God. Don't ever, 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 ever give up on something that you feel God has promised you. 
It may not happen today, but I've seen it happen years later when you thought, it can't happen now, it's too late. Look at Sarah. Abraham was promised seed, and, she, and, and it never happened. And she's like, I don't, I don't even, I tell my wife, like, listen, don't you get pregnant now. <laughs> you know, she went to the doctor here a while back, and the doctor says, man, you are healthy. You better be careful. I'm like, what do you mean be careful? And she's like, like she's 50 years old. She'll get me if I tell you that. We're both 50 years old. He's like, oh, no, you can still have children. I'm like, you're kidding me? That scares me to pieces. <laughs> like, I don't know. No, no, but, but listen, some of you, you think, well, that's past my time. Listen, God controls the time. Right. I, I should have been in business for myself by now, but I'm too. No, listen, don't ever underestimate what God. Now, I'm praying. I don't, I'm not. Listen, put the child thing aside. We have grandchildren now. I'm blessed. I'm not even one anymore. But if you're believing for something, don't give up on it. It was only God determines. My father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer, and they said, you got six weeks to six months to live. My wife and I were talking about this morning. He lived 10 good years after that diagnosis. Nobody can tell you what will or what won't happen to you except God himself. And don't ever underestimate the power of God. If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, all of heaven stands at attention at you. And everything that God has and all the power that he possesses belongs to you. And he says, all I want you to do while you're in the earth is multiply that blessing. The incredible thing is it's not just your biological children that can get it. We can take this inherited blessing and give it to those far from God. We were talking about people that are living underneath or be below standard in their, just the way they live and, and the way they are. They just, they're poor and have nothing. Can I tell you, that's just a part of the curse. That's not a part of the inherited blessing that God has for them. The way you change a person's economic status is they get born again and they step into a blessing and everything changes. He says some people are just, they're just a poverty mentality and they're just unclean or they're this or that. Let me tell you, that's all a part of sin. When sin is removed and the presence of God came, comes in, he takes those things that look like they're nothing and have no value. And before long, he said, this is the most valuable treasure in the whole room right here. That's what God wants us to do to every family, for every family in this region. They don't know they can even have a part of the inheritance. They don't know that God is their father. They just don't know him yet. And all we're challenged with, all we're commissioned with is to take the understanding of what's been given to us and appreciate it in such a way. And I think that word right there is the right word, appreciate. When you appreciate something, it grows and adds value. That's appreciation. So if we appreciate what God has given us, we expand it and multiply it in the lives of others so they can enjoy it also. And that's my prayer. And, and I want us to pray this morning, especially for those of you that have children or grandchildren. My prayer is that God let us get this inheritance into their hands. They're going to do a better job of reaching this generation than I am. Let's get them born again. Let's get every son and daughter and grandchild and grand. Let us get them filled with the spirit and the power of God at a very young age. And just turn them loose into those evil school districts that we keep talking about. The hope of the world is the local church, amen? Yes, amen? The body of Christ scattered among them to make a difference in their lives. Would you stand to your feet this morning? If you have, this is a big one. If you have children or grandchildren, just, just, just wave at me. We're, we're, we're praying for your family right now. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. And even those that stand in this room believing for that opportunity. Today, I pray for miracles as we start this service off today. Lord, part of the blessing is to cause the barren to produce fruit. Joseph himself was proof that no matter what man says, no matter what we see in the natural, his mom was barren until the time was right. And then the blessing came in such a way that he became, as Christ, a savior of the world in his lifetime. I pray, open the barren wombs in this place. Lord, you're not a God that would tease us, that would manipulate us, that would lie to us. You're capable and able. I ask, move every roadblock, everything that would stop it from happening for this body of believers to be fruitful and multiply in every area of our life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, in Jesus' name. 
Lord, I pray particularly for children and grandchildren and the next generations, Lord. That the first of this year you put in my heart to go after the next generation, to reach the next generation with everything. You showed me 10,000 young people in this place, 10,000 young people worshiping in the house of God. And Lord, that's your heart. We've, we've longed to figure out how can we do that? Will a, will a gym do that? Will a kids worship center do that? Will, will pizza do that? Lord, what is it? Well, Lord, I'm convinced that if we'll pass the mantle into the hands of our children, that somehow they will reach their generation around them and that we'll see the thousands. Let it start with our families first. I pray for every son and every daughter, whether they're here or not, that God, your spirit would go after them. Strong conviction would come over any one of them that's not living right, that's not in the will of God, that, Father, your love would tackle them down and bless them when none of us deserve the blessing, Lord. Shower them with goodness and favor. If there's sickness or disease, I pray you cancel it out and curse it, command it to go. Do miracles for even those far from you today. If there's strife in the home and chaos, maybe broken homes, broken families, dysfunctional situations going on, Lord, I pray you begin to mend those things, that you bring peace in the home, that there be such a calm in the home that we say, God, you have changed everything. Let children be obedient and honorable. And Lord, let's, uh, let us honor them as young men and young women. Lead them in the ways of truth and righteousness. Not telling them to do something because we said so, but do something because we're doing it also. Let this blessing, this inheritance, this favor pass on to our children and our grandchildren, even another thousand generations. And Lord, for every person in this community, every person in this region, I pray there's such a drought in our land physically, but Lord, there's a spiritual drought among us as well. There's such a longing and a, and a thirst for righteousness. I pray from places like this that there would be rivers of living water springing up, fountains of life that would fill us and this place, but Lord, would overflow into this region to touch every household and every family, even those far removed from you, Lord, that they would sense your love and your goodness. And as many have found the heights as a place where they can come and get fed, let many more find it as well, that we could all enjoy the blessing together. Lord, I thank you that today is a day of victory. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're not right with God, I want to pray for you. I'm telling you, in a moment, your life can turn around like never before. You just say, I don't have peace with God. I don't have a relationship with God. You may have it one time, but you don't now. Or maybe you've never had that kind of relationship. You've never heard God speak to you, and you're not talking to him. And, and you want that. Just raise your hand as high as you can and say, pray for me. I, I just want to get right with God. Thank you. Anybody else? It's the best decision you can make. Saying, God, I need you in my life. With all boldness. Anybody else? Thank you. There's a few of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we do pray for these that have said, God, I need you. Lord, we're so grateful that you come running after us because you know how much we need you and we know how much you love us. And I pray for these that have boldly said, God, I need you. Lord, the moment they raised their hand and their heart leaped for you, Lord, your heart leapt for them. Lord, I thank you that forgiveness is belongs to them. I, I just want you, those of you that, that said that, and there's probably more of you, just say, within your heart, just say, God, forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me new. I, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I, I want to be led by you. I want to be taken care of by you. I, I want to enjoy this blessing that he's talking about. Father, I thank you that in that moment when we reach out to you and ask for forgiveness and you to come into our life, Lord, you said you are not a man that would give bad gifts to their children, but Lord, you give good gifts. If we asked you for life and forgiveness, you give us life and forgiveness. And I declare that these that have said, I need God, you have God right now in this moment, and you can sense it, you can feel it. God is flooding you right now, and God's going to begin to speak to you and minister to you. God's going to begin to lead you and guide you into ways of truth like you've never known before. And you're going to be a part of the family of God and the inheritance that God has for you. And from this moment forward, you're going to start seeing 
the blessing everywhere you go. I declare that over you. I pray heal the brokenness right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray provide for the areas of weakness, those areas of lack, those miracles that are needed today, the breakthrough that, that you came to this house this morning saying, I need a miracle. Today, let that miracle happen as a result of this decision. Father, I thank you for it. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Can every one of you just welcome them to the family of God this morning? Come on. Awesome. Listen, if, if you were one that raised your hand on your way out, Guest Central is just there by the front door. There's a packet we've put together especially for you that's got a really nice Bible, a Next Steps Bible that we've invested in for you to have, as well as some information that will help you grow. Uh, it just stop by Guest Central and get that. Maybe somebody here in the, in the building has those packets. They can get that to you before you go. We would love for you to have that. If you're a guest, there's actually a nice gift for you at Guest Central on your way out. And we just want to continue to pray for you and ask that you pray for us and that in the coming days you consider, if you're, if you're new with us, we'd love for you to come back and be a part of what God's doing. It's, it's getting really fun around here. Amen. Let me speak a blessing over you. I'm going to dismiss you. I know there was some altar ministry earlier. If you need prayer, don't hesitate to come. We'll wait uh, for you as long as you need. Father, thank you for what you've done today. Thank you for your word. Let it grow deep within us. Thank you for every guest. Lord, if there's, if, if there's not a place for them to fit, they fit here, Father. You fit here. And so we welcome you. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and our hearts. May this be a blessed week. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week. Love you guys. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We pray that you have been blessed by God's word. For more information, visit us online at heightslife.org.